gonna start from the beginning and tell you a little bit about my journey in glass. So originally I wasn't gonna do glass at all. I was gonna do, um, I think it was uh, geosciences engineering. So quite different, but I decided I didn't wanna do that in the end. I wanted to do something that I'd really, really enjoy, that I'd wanna get up to, to do every day. And luckily at that time, there was a TV series that was uh, on, <laughs> it was a Monty Don, I think, and they did glass blowing. I was like, that looks really cool. I want to do that. <laughs> and the, the rest is history. And I absolutely love where I've come now. So I, um, I chose Sunderland, the glass. I am. Um, I chose Sunderland because it has really, really good facilities. The staff there are amazing and it's got a really impressive list of alumni. So this was my first year project. I loved hot glass from the very beginning. It's really, really immediate. You can touch the glass almost. There's just a pad of newspaper between you or a piece of metal. But I really like that you can tell it what to do almost and if something goes wrong you start again you don't have to wait like you would with other disciplines it's really immediate and it's really heavy on hand skills um so during my first year i did this piece which is called memories of war and it was pretty personal so it was featured um I have some photographs that my uncle was taken he was stationed out in the falklands and then they were quite challenging because I'd only been doing glass for a short time and I really wanted these shapes to be quite um, quite fine. So they're actually water canteens from different armies with the one engraving across all three. And then in my second year, I went the complete opposite of that. I wanted to do something that was just really technique driven and aesthetic and designing. So these were my chamber sculptures and they were a study of shells. Uh, so you can see on the picture on the right, that's almost like if you were to cut a shell in half, it's the way the organism inside it grows. So it actually lives within those chambers. Uh, so these was done, uh, these were made, sorry, with the Swedish overlay technique to create all of these different chambers. So it's actually a clear, ball of glass with colour on the outside, which are then picked up and squished all together. So they're then sculpted as one and then cut in half and then cold worked for a long time to give it a really nice high shine. So I've just got a quick video. This is just how they're made. This is filmed, uh, I think it was back in 2018 now at the National Glass Centre and these were I was actually preparing these ones. I did a few more than the ones I actually made in my um, degree show. I made a few more because I um, went and did handmade in queue with some of these as well, because they're just really enjoyable to make. So I'm just picking up here. They're just um, a chain of possibly four balls all together, which I then pick up and I might pick up maybe five of these, squish them all together like that. <laughs> making sure that they're just nice and hot and then giving it lots of marvering, lots of squeezing. These are all really unique. I wasn't able to replicate that at all. Uh, all of these balls the, that create the chambers will just go however they like. So it takes a little while just to heat those all up. It takes a little while to begin with. You have to do these in like two sessions to, do, to create the balls in the first place and then also to do these. So maybe it takes in total two hours of sculpting them and then like a good half a day to polish them up. They're quite labor intensive. I haven't made any in a while. <laughs> I might just skip ahead just to the sculpting bit. So I've just gathered over this and that's how you get that clear edge that you see. So I I think this one was a curled one that I was making. I can't quite remember. Just putting in a jack line. So I am going to skip ahead because otherwise you just see a lot of me heating and a lot of me marvering. So just to stretch it out. Go 
thing. Yeah. So this one's one of the curved ones, the Nautilus shell. Oh, no, that went back to the beginning. So I just curl it all up. And then because they're quite solid masses, they take a little while to cool down. So they maybe take two or three days in the annealer. Just to make sure that they're really stress free because I'm going to do so much cold working on them. So just me just flashing it, making sure it's cold and then they go away. So this will be one of the ones that I was making there. So they're all really unique with the shape and then the size that they make. And then the, these ones will have the three cut faces on it. Um, and I make sure that they're first cut in half with a saw and then just really polished up. So I really love these, but it did make me hate cold working for a little bit. So I tried to not do that in my third year. I went for something different again. So that's just a few more. This one was the fox and then the auger shell, which is the longer one. So my third year is all based on the study of evolution and bacteria. I took samples from different areas around the glass and ceramics department. Um, and I worked with Dr. Lewis Bingle, who worked with the, um, in the science department. I can't remember particularly what his area of study was at the University of Sunderland. Uh, and we actually grew cultures from these swabs that I took around all of the different areas. So I had great delight in showing everyone for a good couple of weeks what was on all the surfaces that they were touching and generally being a pest with all of the <coughs> bacteria. Um, and I took inspiration from these. So these ones you see here are exact uh, copies of the Petri dishes and what samples and cultures actually grew. So um, these were made by uh, everything here I've made um, and they all made it within the hot shop. So the Petri dish itself, the glass one, there, I think they're about 25 to 30 centimeters, these are. Um, so it's the um, Petri dish, it's just blown in clear glass, which I, and then I've made a rondel. And then all of these little marini, the little colored coins, they kind of made like rock. So you just make a really long solid length of glass and then chop it up. So I've taken an image, uh, a photograph of the culture, and then I've taken it into a 3D program. So I used Rhino just to sketch out where the different like, marini wood to replicate the cultures and bacteria that was growing in it and then I had the rondel water jet cut to fit the exact sizes of the marini and then use them so they just sit within the bottom of the petri dish so I did try in another one flooding the bottom with resin but resin and glass along with that curved surface it didn't go very well so that was a little bit of a learning curve and a little bit of a failure the first one unfortunately <laughs> So I, I did quite a lot of pieces for my, uh, my third year. The other pieces I did were kind of the same vein. This was almost taking it one step further. So I was imagining like a hypothesis as if the bacteria that was growing in the Petri dish became a living thing. It became a creature that grew and moved out of the Petri dishes. So these were made with making each of those individual pieces in solid glass with some more of the marini that replicated the Petri dish, what was the actual sample. And then they were attached together hot and then just pulled in different ways just to make it look really, really organic. And then they were glued into, again, more of these free blown Petri dishes at the bottom. So you can see they've got a bit of weird naming and that's because they're actually um, where that was taken from. So I swabbed the, um, the handle of the kettle and it grew some quite interesting things. Uh, and just aesthetically, it was one of the really pleasing ones. So that's why they just have um, uh, the names from where the actual bacteria is taken from. This was spore study. This was a bit of a labor of love. It's really intensive. Each of these, there's four acrylic sheets. There are 25 by 15 centimeters and they're covered with over a hundred little individual pieces of glass cane. 
So I pulled the clean and it's a Zamperico type. So it's got these little white lines and green lines inside of it. And then the cane, or I took it into the flame working area and I created these curves and these little balls on the end to replicate spores of bacteria. And then each one is just ground on the bottom and then it's been UV glued onto the bottom of the acrylic. Um, so I used UV glue because it was the quickest like, cure time, but it took a good week, week and a half to glue all of these. So it took me a long, long time. And this hung above um, people's heads. So you got this really great view from underneath it and a view at how the light went through all of these little spores on the end. And this is a vinyl piece. This is Division and Growth. So this is the piece that was awarded the runner-up prize by the Worshipful Company at the British Glass Biennale 2019. So this is a wall piece. They're each about three kilos and they're about 30 by 40 centimeters wide. And the concept of the piece is that it's the, the same microscope slide but at three different time periods. So you're looking at it from the beginning where there's only one cell of a particular bacteria or a particular, um, oh, the words escaped me, <laughs> a particular little cell. And then it's multiplying, it's dividing and it's growing. And then again, by the end. So this was pulling a lot of, um, the white Marini, I wanted to get a lot of different designs just so it really aesthetically look really nice and it'll pop out at you. And then this green one, I tried to meticulously get it so that the, each one's are in the same place and it grows from the same area. So this took a long, long time. And I have to say thank you to Callum because he had to pull a lot of Marini for me to make this because it's, I think it's about 10 to 12 kilos of glass in this piece. It's a lot. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, then obviously I just fused it together in a kiln. Um, so it's quite a high fuse. It's about 900, 800, 900 degrees. And then this piece just goes really lovely on the wall. So then yeah, after university- Where is that piece now, Emma? Where is that piece? Uh, no one actually told me. Oh, right. I, it was, it was, I think it may be a guy called Brian Clark. He did contact me afterwards, but um, yeah, I didn't actually know. I knew obviously knew you guys that I'd have won, um, been awarded the runner up prize from you and you, we talked to you about it, but no one actually told me who had bought it from like no Biennale staff or anything like that. Maybe Barbara but, will be able to find out for you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. If it's Brian Clark, he's Glass Association. Yeah, I think that's him. I think that's the person. I'll check. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, they asked um, the gentleman. He, yeah, emailed me afterwards just to say that he. But this must have been. It was like a good six to, to nine months after the Biennale just to, to ask me about the wall hangings and how they went. But yeah, no one told me anything about it at the time. But. Uh, it is. I'm just glad that someone liked it and then they, they got it <laughs> and it was... You've, you've had the money? Yeah. <laughs> oh, right. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I kind of want to make more of these actually, but it's so labour intensive because it took us a good couple of days, me and Cal, to pull all this Marini and then I had to chop it with the saw but the saw, um, like a stone saw, but it creates a really rough edge. So I had to use then a flatbed to go on both sides so that it was kind of like a semi polish and then fused it. And it took me like eight hours to get it in the kiln itself because of how, like how meticulous I had to be about where all the Marini was going. It was just so labor intensive, but I really enjoyed it. So I'm like, every now and then I'm like, yeah, maybe I should make another one. I was like, no. I just <laughs> couldn't do something like that outside of uni. Like it just takes so much time. <laughs> but uh, yeah, then so after uni, I moved on to first. I got a um, a four month technical internship at Northland Creative, which is in Leipzig, up in the tippy top of Caithness, 
and it's a fantastic place. It was a really, really good opportunity. So I learned so much about studio maintenance. And then there was also a lot of classes and artists that came through at the same time that I got to just observe and to learn from. And Caithness is just a, a really beautiful location and Northlands is really really great it's um one of the like it's a world center of excellence in the glass it's a really good place to be at and then after that i went that was my first time in denmark i uh, came out for a three-month internship with tobias mool and trina Drisson in abeltoft so again that was really really excellent it's slightly different from northlands whereas here it was in northlands i was uh part of the, I was the assistant technical kind of manager in there. I was just uh, shadowing Michael, who's the technical uh, manager in Northlands. Here I was working as an assistant. Um, but Abletoft is such a beautiful place. Um, and it's also got six hot shops in. It's, a, it's almost a, it's a mini glass community within Denmark. I think there's only two other hot shops that aren't in Abletoft. There's the one where we are here in Hunterstil and there's one in Copenhagen as well so it was a fantastic opportunity and Tobias is such a great artist as well and Trina themselves as well. Um, so this is kind of what we do here. So um, I'm at Backhouse Brown now which is Hunterstil. I moved here in February um, I have been back, I did three months um, back with Tobias and Trina uh, in May but I have been back here. I am now here permanently. <laughs> um, the, we do uh, things from production wear and table wear to lighting as well. And we have more unique pieces as well. So the pieces here, the Pastorelli ones, that's Nana specialty. And we also have the glass uh, biking ships that Andrew works on. So I'm now on the weekends kind of playing with a couple of new ideas, trying to make some new work. Uh, I first started with this idea in Northlands last year and I'm really happy with the direction that it's going now. I don't really have a title for them yet, I just kind of refer to them as basket series. So these are kind of coming from just what I was talking about at the beginning, that love of the immediacy of hot glass that you've got you, really hard to photograph but we've got the clear glass basket at the bottom and those are just made from just uh, dribbling the glass and just letting it do whatever it wants and it's just a really unique shape because of the material that glass is I'm not sure that you'd be able to do something like this you have it also this it's quite a strong structure but fragile because it's glass at the same time and they just go really lovely with these top bits as well. I'm just, yeah, just enjoying these, just playing on them in the beginning. I haven't shown these anywhere else yet, so this is uh, exclusive. Uh, yeah, and uh, this is the last slide, it's just a video if you're interested in watching those, but I don't know how we are on time. All right, you're fine. Yeah, should I play that one, Paul? So this is, uh, the, this is the new studio, and that's um, Paul, who's the other assistant here, and he's also British as well. So we are, there's three Brits here, because <laughs> Andrew's British. So it's a Brit heavy hot shop. Lots of chatting, a bit of glass. <laughs> do, you spend, do you spend all day Saturday and Sunday in the studio on your own? No, just Sunday morning. So we, we start work at 7.30. So on the weekends, we tend to get in about, we, get, we tend to get in about eight because we can't quite bring ourselves to get in there that early, especially now it's getting dark. Um, but we normally do we normally do the full morning from like eight till one or something, and it's really nice that we get the opportunity to do that. Well, 
have all the stainless steel to cover everything up and make it look rather smart. Yeah, it's really you're nice. saying you get a lot of visitors into the studio. Yeah, I think, uh, obviously I can't say that much for this year's numbers because they have been affected, but because of the location, Hunda still being a really, really beautiful seaside place and so close to Copenhagen, I think the the numbers, the before, the average has been like up to 80,000 visitors in a year or a summer maybe. It's quite a lot. And are the Danes big collectors of glass? Yeah, I also think just as a rule, they are really appreciative of handcraft. They've got a really big, maybe not tradition, but just heritage and love of design. So they are willing to spend more on a object, that, of a, on a quality object as it were, rather than going to like Ikea and getting a glass for two pound, three pound or something, they'd rather spend a little bit more on it and get something that's either unique or, um, or handmade. Fascinating. There must be a shop at the site there. Yeah. Mm. Uh, if I just stop sharing. Yeah, there's, um, we have quite a large uh, building. I think it's 144 square meters. It's quite a large Ooh. studio. Um, so we've got on one side, there's the shop, which has the production stuff, the bowls, the glasses. We do a lot of stem wear as well. And then we have our studio, the area that we work in. And then the other half has got um, a lot of the Viking ships that we have, because just kind of keep them down the end and Nana's Pastorelli work. What time do you want me? That says lovely stuff. What intrigues me is that you, there are three Brits there. Um, yeah. Wh why have we all arrived uh, in Denmark in that particular? Um, so I, I think it's just when the opportunity comes along, that's where you go. So um, obviously Andrew's been out here for 30 years now. Um, <laughs> so there was just, uh, Andrew is the Brown of Backhouse Brown. Um, originally I was actually in Abletoft and obviously they're such a tight knit community that when I think, um, when I finished there and I didn't have with the uh, Tobias and Puna and I didn't have anything to go to, it was just a, they popped a message out and they were like, does anyone like want someone like an assistant? So off I popped to, to Hunda still. So I'm just, uh, come over here and it just happened that, uh, the other assistant is also British as well. We like to make fun of it and we talk about food and Yorkshire puddings quite a lot. <laughs> well, understandably, and I hope you're uh, teaching the Danish how to eat properly. Yeah. <laughs> Someone said it was very brown and I was like, I'm trying not to be offended, but if I think of a lot of good British foods, they are very brown, <laughs> but tasty. <laughs> So do you anticipate you know, making your, your life career uh, in Denmark? I'm not, uh, I'm not sure. It's really hard to say because obviously this year has been so out of the ordinary that I don't have anything mm. to base it on. Um, and obviously there are things that I miss back home and things that I want to come home for. Um, it's just where's the opportunity? What if something else happens or something can come here or whatever? You're, you're obviously in love with glass as a material. Yeah, yeah, I really love it. That was part of what, when I was looking for a career and when I was looking for a degree that I wanted to love and wanted to be really excited about coming into work in the morning. When I was looking at glass, part of the prospects of just being crafty is you know, you're your own boss, you can do what you love, but also the traveling and I'm just really happy and really lucky that this traveling has happened and I am able to explore different cultures and countries. And also I know so many people across the world because of glass. So I really love that side of things as well as obviously the making it. 
Are you still doing some pieces for competitions? Yeah, the, um, those pieces that I was showing at the end, the new basket, um, like the vessels in the baskets, they're the new work that I'm working on. I don't actually have anything left from my degree show in terms of for exhibitions and competitions. So it's like a good incentive to start on the new stuff. How much longer are you there for? I don't have an end, so it's just a rolling contract. So it's just however, I guess, however long I want to stay out here, unless unless they have other work, like other ideas for me. <laughs> but uh, I I just want to stay. I really like it. Well, you can probably see on the screen uh, our uh, co-master Mark Holford is sitting in front of some of his glass collection. Um, you, you, you need to chat him up to make him uh, in, really interested in what your... Uh, I, I caught your uh, talk to CGS. You did? Good. Yeah. I had another version I did for gas as well. I didn't see that one. Well, you could, if you go to the, if you go to the um, YouTube on gas, it's quite... You oh, could, good. Quite, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it, it was really interesting same, and fascinating. It's, it's slightly different. Um, you know, it's, uh, but I also had the, like then, I had the artists. Mm. I was going to ask, what, what, do you sell through galleries? Do you sell direct? How, 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 how what, what are you doing about that? Mm, I, so far, because I'm quite, re like, really new to this, I've sold through a couple of galleries. So I've had um, some pieces in the gallery up in Staves, and then also online as well with um, Boha Gallery. Um, or I've most, or I've mostly sold direct, um, or again, and some of the pieces through the Biennale as well. So I don't know which one that counts as. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. so you might call the Biennale a, a sort of gallery. Mm. That's what I thought. Yeah, yeah. Do, do you um, do you know of the firm Holmergaard? Does that still exist in Denmark? It does. The person that I'm actually replaced has moved there. Right, I was wondering if they still do, because they used to do, in my day, a long time ago, they used to do studio work, some studio, you know, unique pieces. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I think they do. I haven't actually been to go them, like, I haven't actually been there myself, but I think they still yeah. do, like, a few yeah. unique pieces. Yeah, yeah. I was very privileged to meet Michael Bang, who is the designer of Home Guard, um, particularly mm. on the studio side, and that was a great privilege. Ah, good. So oh, I, I have to say, um, I'm sorry that we're in England and, and you're in Denmark because we can't mm. come and watch you at the moment. No. Um, which would That's be lovely. Okay. Um, so we'll we'll have to. Uh, uh, Barbara, have you worked out where your uh, Jolly is going to be in a couple of years' time. <laughs> I have, I have. <laughs> Too late in that case to, to change to Denmark. <laughs> is, that Bogner, is that going to be Bogner Regis, Barbara? Oh, well, no, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with Bogner. Very nice part of the world. Uh, so when is when is your uh, website going to be up and running, Emma? Hopefully in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, I had to send like a really frantic uh, email to Paul yesterday. Like I just checked my website and it's it's not working. So I'm uh, I'm gonna take it's because it's just something I I kind of take for granted that it's just it's there. Um, because I haven't mm -hmm. actually had to. Fortunately, I haven't been able to do much because obviously I haven't been working uh, on my own work. So uh, I do, I put on my Instagram fairly regularly, um, but I'm going to take this opportunity just to get some nice photos of the new work um, and try and get it up and running within the next couple of weeks or month or so. Did the studio we... close in the early days of COVID? Yeah, we, I, I worked here, I arrived in the middle of February 16th, I think, and we worked for three weeks and then we shut down and we were on furlough. For how long? So, uh, well, I was on furlough for three more weeks and then I moved back to Abletop to work for Tobias and Trina for three months again. 
but I think they were on um, Paul and then we had another assistant at the time, a Finnish girl called Henna. I think they were on furlough for two months in total, I think. Gosh. Well, it's been the strangest of years. Yeah, a horrible year. Um, yeah. so whether when, you um, um, visited, there's a place where they make fiberglass in Denmark because the jolly, I can't remember how many years ago it was, we came on a jolly to Denmark and I was fascinated by how they made fiberglass as thin as a piece of hair. As, and um, the the factory was had, was just clean as anything. It was amazing. And I think it was just outside Copenhagen. And I can't remember the name of the master at the time. I don't know if there's anybody with us that came yeah. on that jolly. I remember it. Do you, yeah. Have you used any fiberglass, you know, or come across anybody making that? Emma? No, no, because what we make is more of the unique, the production wear stuff like that. Um, not, uh, a f I imagine that fiberglass is so highly regulated that it's a factory setting. There are artists who do actually now use it within their glass artwork, which is really fascinating, yeah. where they will incorporate the furnace glass with fiberglass on the outside as well. Right, yeah, it's really an odd thing. It was yeah. just very interesting. Um, yeah. It was used so widely now. I have many happy memories of Denmark working professionally. Those snaps. <laughs> they like snaps here yeah. and beer. Confusing that so many few, everybody seems to have the same surname. <laughs> Jensen. Jensen. <laughs> Anderson, Anderson and so yeah. <laughs> on. Emma, did liquid some... lunch, very liquid. <laughs> Emma, dance. Have a look at um, Vanessa. Have you met? Did you meet Vanessa Cutler at the Biennale? Yeah, yeah. I met her. She was an alumni of Sunderland. Oh, so right. she's been up. She'd been up a couple of times as well yes. when uh, we did were she there. Did a presentation for us last week. Um, which goes into her sort of passion of sort of mixing engineering and things like that with the glass that she's producing. Um, I was just thinking about your interest in sort of science engineering, mm. but that might give you some other ideas of adventures that you might have. I would say her videos on, on our YouTube feed, if you want to look at it. Yeah, thank you. You might find it interesting to have another conversation with her at some point in time. Yeah because she wants to start exploring, although she's been teaching, she wants to ex start exploring the art side again and perhaps not do quite so much teaching. So it'd be quite interesting to see mm. where she's going to take that sort of inspiration. If you, I don't know, have, have anybody been to Abeltoft? It's a, it's a great place to go. They have a fantastic glass museum. Yeah. Currently has a Guggisberg and Baldwin exhibition. I think I'm right in saying. Um, yeah, it was awesome. I saw it when it, it was there for the opening. All oh, right. Is it still there? Uh, I think so, because it I got delayed because of the uh, COVID. So it opened when I was there in June, I think. Yeah, I think it's there. It's all. a really, really nice exhibition. It is. And it's a great place to go. It's a lovely. Mm. It has this enormous uh, old, um, I think it's a warship next door. To the museum, yeah. Which is maintained by A.P. Moller, I think. The Forgotten. Yeah. And yeah. in Aarhus, which is only half an hour away, you can fly to. There's an excellent modern art museum as well. I saw a yeah. wonderful Bill Viola, if any of you know him. He's a video artist. A exhibition there. Absolutely stunning. If yeah. you ever want to open conversations with some of the older uh, glass artists in Abletoft, Ask them about their time in Briley Hill, because most of them did do a lot of training there. Nana did. My boss here, Nana, uh, trained at Briley Hill. Mm. Yes, they used to when get would that have been? How long ago? Oh, it's well, it's been closed for. Yeah, it's closed a while. Fifteen yeah. years. Because that's like the heritage, like Nana trained at Briley Hill and Andrew's from Stourbridge. 
Well, he trained at Stourbridge. But yeah, a lot of them, because Tina trained at Briley Hill as well. It's a really like, it's a really kind of a odd connection, but like a really nice connection that there's so many people are there and then they train somewhere so close to home. Were you at Born Home with uh, Sally Fox? Pardon, sorry? Were you at Born Home when Sally Fox was teaching there? No, I've never been to Born Home. Oh, I thought you had. Sorry, I missed it. No. Right. You should go there. They've got the most yeah. amazing, huge hares that live on the island. Because <laughs> when I saw one, I thought it was a dog, but it's a hare. <laughs> Yeah, I've been meaning to, but it's just been really hard because uh, to just to find the time and the traveling and stuff as well. Because that was the thing, just like the transport's really great, but I just really miss just getting in a car and driving somewhere and not relying on like buses and trains. What What are your rules on lockdown at the moment in Denmark, if there are any? There are some. So when we have to wear on public transport, you have to wear a mask. I think we can only... It's lovely that you don't really know. I think that's brilliant. It doesn't, it doesn't really affect me. When you have to, if you go into a restaurant, uh, you have to wear a mask when you go in and don't have to when you sit down, but when you get up to go anywhere to pay or to the toilet, you have to put a mask on. Yeah. And then we have less people inside. I think it's 50. 50, in a, you can only have 50 people, I think. It really doesn't affect me. Yeah, <laughs> I good. cycle to work and then I come home yeah. and then I go to the shop like late at night when there's no one there. So oh, lovely. Like... Brilliant. <laughs> but following on from David's question, uh, as a nation, is, is this uh, uh, being treated very seriously uh, <coughs> with a lot of yeah. and just self-distancing, etc.? Yeah, I mean, there's always going to be your exceptions, but it's always been taken quite seriously. It was like, that's why we locked down super early. And um, I mean, I know there's less people here, um, but our cases were very little because of, there's just so much trust. This is the rules, so you do it. Um, but you will always find exceptions. And there's still the problems here where... Um, they say that it's mostly the younger generation and obviously Copenhagen will be the highest as well because it's just such a dense city. Right. Well, there are not many people on this call from the younger generation. I can just see a couple. Oh, well, speak, speak, speak for yourself, Master. <laughs> I like to think of myself as a younger generation. Well, age is only a measurement of time anyway. Right. Yeah. I think that was quite stunning, Emma. Pardon, sorry? Quite stunning and interesting to see where you're developing. Thank you. The ideas that you're getting there. Uh, as Callum's on, can we, can we just ask Callum to tell us what you're up to, Callum? Uh, yeah, of course. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm... Uh, based in, in Hartford, uh, like I was saying, and I'm working with a uh, uh, bespoke lighting manufacturer. Uh, I've, oh. I've just come from work. I have the t-shirt on. <laughs> it's, Rothschild. Uh, That's quite a good name, Rothschild. Yes. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rothschild and Bickers. When uh, we've all heard. Pardon? <laughs> Uh, and so I've been I've been working there making uh, we make bespoke uh, lighting um, for the majority of the kind of two minutes to uh, interior designers uh, as well as uh, restaurants and hotels things like that. Uh, but I also have my own uh, like art practice that I've been developing uh, on the side of that. Um, could you tell us about a couple of the exhibitions you've recently um, been exhibiting? <laughs> like, you know, you could sell yourself a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, this year has been a little unusual, but um, so I was uh, exhibited with uh, Milano yes. uh, Vetro Under 35, 
which was a, a competition for uh, glass makers under 35 that was held, housed in the castle in, in Milan. Uh, and that was open from February, and it was supposed to run until May, I think, but then obviously because of everything that happened in, in Northern Italy, um, it ended up running until September and being open on a kind of um, shortened weekly basis. I'm not sure exactly how they handled it, uh, but it, it ran until September. And uh, I've just recently had uh, two sets of work uh, accepted into the Heijan fifth session international glass exhibition and competition if I've remembered that right, in um, uh, in China, in Gangju, uh, China. Wow. Um, and that uh, has, has just arrived there in the post, which I'm very excited about. <laughs> in, one bit worried. in one piece. In one piece, thankfully. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so that is, uh, one of those is the same piece that was exhibited in Milan, and the other one is a continuation of the series that I I won the uh, the Crafts Prize for from, from you guys. Uh, so it's another seven of a similar, the, the white vessels with the drawings on, uh, and there's another seven of those. So I think that opens in December, so... Uh, I will keep you posted, Paul. <laughs> and is that a competition or just an exhibition? A uh, competition uh, as well as an exhibition. I think they have a, they have a kind of big ceremony where uh, the museum will uh, acquire uh, some of it and then uh, what they don't choose to acquire is uh, auctioned, I think, as part of this big ceremony. And then the museum puts on a, an exhibition. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to be invited yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a whole festival because it coincides with a flame working one as well. It seems to be quite a big thing. Mm. Yeah, I'd not heard of it. Um, how did you get? How did you get invited to be an exhibitor there? Uh, so, uh, Alan J. Paul. Um, forwarded a, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, forwarded, a, I think someone had got into contact with him with the details and open call. And then he forwarded that uh, to, to everyone on his mailing list. And I just applied through, uh, through their contact, um, Professor Zhao. Wow. Uh, I, think, I think it's related to the university over there. I'm not sure. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, you have to keep us posted on that. Maybe we'll get you to uh, do a presentation for us and, and, start and find some pictures of what you've been doing. I'd love to, if that's of interest. Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah, we'll have to. Yes. It's lovely to see two glass artists who we've been involved with uh, and hope, hopefully we've helped uh, and that you're taking up glass in art as a career. Um, yes. If there's anything that we can do as a livery to help you, um, you know, you must keep in touch with us, keep in touch with Paul to uh, uh, make certain that uh, we hear about what you're doing. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Well, we've hit that. We've hit that one hour sort of curfew time, ladies and gentlemen. So I think we'll call it a day for today. Thanking Emma and, and Callum for joining us, talking about yeah. their class. Thank you, Thank you both. for inviting me. Oh, it's a yeah. pleasure. Um, yeah. Thanks, Emma. I just mentioned, Thanks, Bill. Great pleasure. Just mentioned to you <laughs> next week, we're going to be wine tasting. <laughs> and the details will be coming out tomorrow. <laughs> you have to go and do some shopping. Uh, um, but we're going to start a series called The Taste of the Grape, which will be, when you've read the screed that it comes out tomorrow, you should find it quite interesting. Because if you've ever been worried about what to buy, or baffled by all the selection of wines there are on shelves where you do your shopping for wine, then we might be able to give you some clues on how to go about it a bit more scientifically than the classic looking at the name 
that you can recognize or doing the price um, that you're prepared <laughs> to pay or randomly putting a pin down to see what you like. So we're trying to do it a bit more scientifically and work on that. Um, and just as a thought and a sideline, Emma and Callum, this is, not, this is a question for you. Would you like to be on our mailing list for the company so you keep up to date with what we're doing? Yes, please. Yes, Callum? Please. All right, yes, I'll put you on the mailing list. You might get annoyed with some of our missives, but at least you'll know what we're doing. It gives you, <laughs> gives you a reminder to stay in touch. Lots of people do. <laughs> yeah. On that note, everybody, have a lovely evening and enjoy Thank the you. weekend. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye